Welcome to the 2021 IWMF Ed Forum and Self-Care Workshop. My name is Paula Eastman and I am a WM patient. I was diagnosed in 2014. 2015, I had a series of rituxan uh, due to my polyneuropathy. I am uh, currently wait and watch. The new term is active monitoring as we learned in the ad from last week. And I am an identical twin and I have four grandchildren with a set, four, two of the four are twins. Uh, at this time, I would like to announce and uh, introduce our speaker, Dr. Maureen Hanley. Dr. Maureen Hanley is an associate professor at the college, New England College of Optometry. She is um, a very good uh, expert in eye issues for patients with this rare disorder. Uh, Dr. Hanley is a longtime friend of IWMF, and some of you all might already know her from her contributions to the Torch magazine and also her frequent speaking at WM events such as this one. Following uh, Dr. Hanley's presentation, uh, I also forgot to announce, and I want to announce that I'm also a member of the IWMF a People of Color support group, which is new to IWMF. Uh, Dr. Hanley, following her presentation, she will take questions from the audience, and I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Hanley so we can get started. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. So I'm coming to you from Boston, Massachusetts. We just had the Boston Marathon. Um, this week and our weather here is great. So I hope things are going well where you are from. So let's talk about Waldenstrom's in the eye, the topic of this talk. So let's look at the eye. And when I give a talk like this, we have all levels of patients here. So we have patients who are accountants and are into math, we have people who are biology teachers who know all the parts of the eye, and we also have doctors. So I try to start basic so we're all on the same page. Just like if I was to listen to my husband talk about electrical engineering, I know nothing. Um, so I try to start very basic. So if we look, this is the cornea, this is the clear dome of the eye. Um, then if we go here, this is the iris. And they're either blue or brown or green. This is the lens inside your eye. Um, and if you are older and have had cataract surgery, that lens is replaced with an artificial polycarbonate lens. This is the vitreous where the fluid lies. And many of us have floaters. Uh, which are like little spider webs and we see, and they live in the vitreous here. And then at the back part of the vitreous is where all the action happens for Waldenstrom's, and that's your retina. Then all the fibers from your retina travel into your optic nerve. And this is your optic nerve. So your optic nerve is where glaucoma happens. Your retina is where the bleeding would happen. The lens is where the cataract would happen. In the cornea, and some of you may have rear opacities from Waldenstrom's. So let's look at the eye as far as the retina. So this is a patient's left eye. This here is their optic nerve. The nice pink tissue is just a normal rim. It's all like, if we take a location, all the fibers come in and there's little capillaries. This is our fovea, which is the center. With, there's, of all the retina we have, there's only one little spot that allows us to see 2020 and find details. And that's the fovea. And the fovea is part of the macula. So some of you who may unfortunately have macular degeneration, the drusen, um, the waste products are, would be in this macular region here, not related to uh, WM. And then we have our darker vessels. This is our vein. And then this is our arteries. 
Now, this is a totally normal patient here. And you can notice that in this particular patient, the arteries are a little wiggly and the veins are a little wiggly. And that's what makes it hard to maybe diagnose someone who doesn't have Waldenstrom's with Waldenstrom's because many patients have little twisties and turnies just by normal, what we call normal tortuosity. So that's what your back of your eye looks like, your retina, your optic nerve, and your macula. Here's another eye. So all our eyes look different. And it's why it, you know, like optometrists, we just study the eye. Well, we also study the body too, but mostly the eye for four years, because just like if you look, you walk down the street in Boston and you see on any given day, thousands of people and they all look different. Your eyes all look different. Um, your eyes all look different in the back of the eye. And sometimes it's very hard to say normal from abnormal. So here's another eye. You notice that this person's eye, the retina looks more like a tiger. It's totally normal. This retina looks lighter. Again, totally normal. The person has lighter coloring where this person here had a little bit darker coloring. So usually the darker your skin tone, the darker your fundus, what we call the fundus or um, the whole coloring of the posterior pole would be. So here's another person, optic nerve, vein, and artery, fovea, and macula. And here's this person's other eye. So when we think of Waldenstrom's and when you talk to an eye doctor, they only think of one thing and that's retina. So in Waldenstrom, the earliest sign of a problem is venous dilation. So what does that mean? It means if the veins are this big, they're just a little bit bigger, okay? Very hard to say because we all have a little different size. So the ratio, so when as eye doctors we look, we have a arteries and we have veins. And the way we grade this, we don't go in and measure it, but the ratio is roughly two to three. So our arteries are smaller than our veins. If our veins got wider, then the ratio would be two to four. And we may indeed see that, but the first is, that the veins kind of dilate because of the increased serum viscosity. Then you get your tortuosity. You have changes in the cells that line. So here is our vein and the changes in the cells that line here. And those are called endothelium cells. And when those aren't nice and stiff and you lose them, the veins become more wiggly or tortuous. As we talked, however, people can have normal endothelium cells and still have tortuosity. So the picture gets confusing. If you have Waldenstrom's and diabetes, it's very hard to tell how much of the bleeding in your eye is from Waldenstrom's and how much of the bleeding is from diabetes just by looking at the eye. I mean, certainly you would have to look, how's your A1C, how are, how's your um, IgM? because they can look very similar. So when I was asked to speak the last time was when the um, convention or forum was in Providence and a person came up to me and started talking to me and said, would you mind looking at my photos? And I said, sure, I'll look. Um, and he allowed me to share them with you today. So if we look here at this gentleman here, this is his optic nerve. The extra white material, don't you worry about that. It's kind of like, uh, it has a certain name to it, nothing to do with Waldenstrom's. But you can look right here and you can see that the man has hemorrhages. Whenever you see a hemorrhage in your eye, it's not normal. Now, if you look at his veins, this one's a little bit wider they're really not very twisty, a little twisty, not abnormally twisty. 
if I was to look at him and not see the hemorrhages, I would say, oh, this is a little dilated and think nothing of it. But you see all these hemorrhages and at the time his IgM was 10,900. There's a lot of individual variability though. I could look at another patient who has IgM of 10,000 and them have no hemorrhages, but we'll get into the statistics later. So this was his right eye and this was his left eye. And you can see here another hemorrhage, what we call a cotton wool spot, hemorrhages here. His arteries are twisty, which have nothing to do with anything with Walden's drum really. This vein's a little dilated. So in the eye, we have two kinds, well, we have many kinds of hemorrhages, but these are like what we call dot and blot hemorrhages. They're in a certain layer of the retina and they're kind of like in the middle of the retina. And in this eye, he has ones that are flamed, which is more like closer to the top of the retina and they look like feathers. And then this little thing here, this is called a cotton wool spot. And that's really where the small arterial has infarded that area of retina. It's a very small infarct, but that little tiny bit of retina uh, will not function correctly anymore. So the cotton wool spot is usually large. So if this was the size of a cotton wool spot, but in and of themselves, they're small. But if it was this big, the area that's actually infarded is very tiny. It's just the rest is all the swelling, okay? So this person had an IgM of 10,900. He certainly has retinopathy. We call it Waldenstrom's retinopathy or hyperviscosity retinopathy. Now, if I had seen this gentleman in my office in, Walden's drums would not necessarily pop to mind because Walden's drums is very, very real. Okay. We see this every single day because one out of four people over the ages of 65 have diabetes. Okay. And many of them have what we call diabetic retinopathy. And it really looks almost identical. So if I had seen this patient, now this person was nowhere near 65. Um, I believe he was in his early 50s. I would certainly send him for a CBC and an A1C. See what CBC was, see how his um, diabetes was. Um, and then you move on from there. If the diabetes is fine, then you have to investigate. And that's how many of you were um, diagnosed with Waldenstrom's, okay? Um, so before we discuss any more about hemorrhaging, it's also important to know that other things cause hemorrhaging besides diabetes that do affect people who have Waldenstrom's. So there are a certain percentage of people who are, have hemolytic anemia. And if you hit hematocrit falls below 50%. So let's say your normal crit is 40. So if your crit falls to 20, especially if your platelets are low, so platelets are usually 150,000 to 450. So let's say your crit, is 20 and your platelets are like say 45,000 rather than 150,000, you can just get bleeding just because of those numbers. Forget the hyperviscosity, just because of those numbers, you can get bleeding. And what really causes all these hemorrhages, the cause of hemorrhages is secondary to anoxic damage to the endothelium cells of the retinal capillaries. And then we have decreased platelet counts can delay the sealing of the endothelium cells, therefore causing our hemorrhages. 
low platelet count just by itself. Many people who have Wogan's jumps just have a low platelet count and they can get bleeding just from the low platelet count. Hypertension and diabetes can cause it as can carotid blockage. So not all of you who have, have a hemorrhage in the back of your eye, is it from Waldenstrom? The ones who have and who do have Waldenstrom, it could still be diabetes. It could be hyperviscosity. It could be because your crit is so low. It could be because your platelets are so low. Okay. The cotton wool spots are actually microinfarctions. They're white-centered hemorrhages. You can also get leaky of fat. When, we, when, we, when you hear the word hot extradates, that's lipids leaking out of the vessels. And those look yellow. You can also get the endothelium cells get damaged. The lipids can also leak out. So here is a patient from a colleague of mine, and you can see this poor gentleman did not have Waldenstrom's, but he had severe anemia, and you can see all the hemorrhages that he had. And this is with a special filter that we use. Okay. Here's another person. This person has, these are huge cotton wool spots with flame-shaped hemorrhages. This is a patient, so any bleeding in the eye is abnormal. This is a patient that we saw years ago. You can see the fluffy white thing is um, a cotton wool. You can see here um, a large hemorrhage. And this person, this is your macula way over here. This person unfortunately just came in because he needed new glasses. And when he came in, uh, we noticed the hemorrhages. Uh, we sent him for a blood work and unfortunately he had acute leukemia and died two weeks later. Um, so any hemorrhages that you see on the retina are abnormal and need to be accounted for. What is the etiology of them? This is what his other eye looked out like and you can see the huge hemorrhage that he had here. Many times when you go to the eye doctor, so here is a picture um, of a patient who I actually saw at Jocelyn, but it just gives you an example. So we're looking here and that looks good. We're looking here and that looks good. And we're looking here and we see one hemorrhage. It's a good idea why you keep your eyes open. I know a lot of you hate going to the eye docs because the eye is so bright. But if you squint a lot, it's harder for us to do our job. So let's say this is a patient here. Let's say it's Paul or a moderator. And let's just say her IGM is, let's say 3,500. Her serum viscosity is, uh, let's say 2.5. Well, what are we going to do with her? Well, that's not my decision to make. I would call her oncologist and say, just want to let you know that she does have one hemorrhage. I'll see her back in about four months unless you should think I should see her earlier and let you know if she has more hemorrhages. And then your oncologist will decide if one hemorrhage is enough for him or her to start your treatment or not. Okay, here's another patient. A lot of the hemorrhages that start with Waldenstrom start in the very far periphery of the eye because the retina is the thinnest out there. And you can see this guy has a pretty big hemorrhage out here. Usually they're just small ones, but it's easy to see this large one right out here. So here is the macular. Here's where you see, here's where you read. So this hemorrhage really ain't gonna hurt you. As far as seeing, you're really not gonna know you have it. But why is it important? Because it can reflect how your Waldenstrom is doing. How is it affecting your eye? How's it affecting your brain, your kidneys, et cetera? Um, here's another one you see, this is diabetes, but you would see the same thing with Waldenstrom's. You can see how twisty this vessel is. 
You can see all the little hemorrhages. The green color that you see is just their fundus. This was a um, African-American patient. The fundus is a little bit darker, a little bit different in color. Okay. Also, since most people who have Waldenstrom's are over the age of 50, not all, but most, we're also dealing with other issues. Here's an artery, and the artery has a little arterial sclerotic changes. And when it comes over the vein, it kind of bulges the vein here, and it makes it look sausagey, but it's not from hyperviscosity, it's from that artery crossing. So think of the veins are very pliable. You could like step on a vein and squish it. The arteries are very forceful. They're very hard. So you've got this pliable vein and the artery just pushes on it and causes sometimes a bleed there or sometimes just a distortion in the caliber of the vein. So, Let's look here. Let me move my share screen to the bottom so I can see. Let's talk about Waldenstrom's retinopathy specifically. You all know it's a small C lymphoma and it secretes monoclonal IgM, which is a large protein. And this large protein increases the blood viscosity, causing venous dilatation, segmentation, tortuosity, and sludging. And you all know you can get hemorrhages from this. Although it varies, it, everyone is different. Patients with an IgM of over 3,000 are at risk for retinal bleeding. That's a general statement. Over 3,000, you're at risk for general bleeding. You should get your eyes examined. You should get them dilated. Does that mean that someone who has IgM below that shouldn't have an eye exam. I'm not saying that. I'm saying you're at increased risk for bleeding if you have over 3,000. Now, you might have heard someone earlier this week, I don't know, say 4,000. The studies vary. Um, you can hear other people say, well, if it gets to be 6,000, I'm not going to wait for a problem in the eye to happen. I'm just going to treat. So there's all different varieties as you sit and listen to all different oncologists. And it's also a, a give and take on the patient versus the oncologist also. But in general, over 3,000, make sure you get a good dilated eye exam. In the early stages of Waldenstrom's, you only see small hemorrhages in the far, far periphery. And you need to indent, this is what we call a scleral depressor. In the scleral depressor, you indent the eye. It, oops, it doesn't hurt. Uh, they can see me. Is that correct, Jessica? Can they see what I'm doing? All right. So this is a scleral depressor. It doesn't hurt. Look down. And with this, I can see the far periphery of the eye. Without it, you cannot go to the very edge. So you just have them look down, press on. There's this woman looking into the guy's eye. So you should have a scleral depression done when you do it because it allows us to see them way out. And that's where they start. Now, again, they can also start there with diabetes and they tend to also start there with carotid issues because many patients on this list have many diagnoses. Okay, so then we progress and it becomes more evident in the posterior pole. And the posterior pole is what we see by just looking directly on, not in the far periphery. And as you can see with the patient, I showed you from Providence, he had cotton wools and you could see the hemorrhages straight on. Then you can get um, vein occlusions, you can get more swelling, and you can actually have a, a full-blown central vein occlusion where what happens is you get a thrombus or a blood clot in the main vein that supplies the eye and then you get blood everywhere in a, in a more elementary way to think of it. And sometimes the eye does not recover from that. So here is a Waldenstrom's patient. If we see this patient and the IgM was elevated at all, I would suggest to their oncologist 
he has significant neuropathy, he should be treated, or at least educated that he should be treated. And here we see the cotton wool spots and all the hemorrhages. And indeed, this was a Waldenstrom patient. This is a branch vein occlusion. The veins are more pliable because the hyperviscosity, they're already thickened. The artery comes clamps it, and then you get a vein occlusion. From wherever this drains, it bleeds out and you can see the large um, branch vein occlusion. This is a branch. You can also get them right at the optic nerve in the main vein that goes into the eye and that would be called a central vein occlusion. Here's just one taken from the internet. You can see the, the dilatation of all the veins. So we know that normal serum viscosity is 1.4 to 1.8 times that of water. We know in Waldenstrom's it can go as high as six or greater. Retinopathy has been noted as low as 2.1 in the far periphery. Uh, however, the average serum viscosity associated with retinopathy is about 5.6. So is it possible you have one or two hemorrhages if your serum viscosity is too possible? Um, but usually the retinopathy in the posterior pole, what we look at with the optic nerve, in the fovea is about 5.6. So there's a lot of variability among Waldenstrom's patients. There's also a lot of variability on how the eyes behave. So you can see patients and they can have, they have a clean retina and no hemorrhages. And then weeks, months later, they can have a full blown branch retinal vein occlusion or central retinal vein occlusion. Can we predict these things? Sometimes we can, not all the time. It's really important to realize that not everyone with Waldenstrom's will have retinal problems. Um, it's estimated 40% will. Um, another study that I just looked at said like 24, but a lot of people will and it's somewhat related to the concentration of monoclonal IgM. But again, very variable. So here is the central retinal vein occlusion. You can see the whole optic nerve is swollen. The main brain has a big thrombus in it. And here we go. It's very complicated. There are two types of central retinal vein occlusion, ischemic and non-ischemic. Some do get better, many do not. But this person was 2020 the day before. And then once this bleeds, their vision is somewhere in the 2400 range, which is like worse than reading the big E when you think of going to the eye doctor. Okay. So there was a study done several years. The study is getting old in Boston here. And they looked at 46 patients with Waldenstrom's and compared it to 14 age-related match normals. They looked at how fast the blood goes um, through the capillaries, the blood column, and then they classified things. So here we have someone with Waldenstrom's, retina looks good, no problem. Then we have B, yeah, they thought the veins looked a little dilated, uh, could be normal if it wasn't in the picture. Then we see the hemorrhages in the periphery. So not whether you can see the optic nerve and macula, but further out. And then here we see the optic nerve is swollen. We can see more hemorrhages, et cetera. Okay. So they divided them into groups. So you all should know your IgM. So you could think of what group by you in. Group one had no retinopathy. The mean IgM was 3,569 plus or minus 2,000, say. And the mean serum viscosity was 2.5 plus or minus 0.7. Group two had the dilated vessels, the peripheral hemorrhages. So the vision is not being affected yet. Um, and you can see the range, the range of IgM, the mean, the average was about 5,400. 
and you can see the serum viscosity. Um, the average was three, one, the range was here. Group three had both peripheral and central. So central just means this is the eye, this is the optic nerve, this is the fovea. What we see when we look in, this is central. And this is peripheral. Okay, so you can see the range. But I have to tell you, everyone is different. It's not just the IgM, it's also the hematocrit, it's also your platelet status. It's also, do you have diabetes on top of this? Do you have carotid artery disease on top of this? Are you, so it's multifocal, but you can kind of get an idea of what's happening here. Okay. So the study continued and you can certainly see the results. Um, what the study, another study also showed that if you had plasmapheresis, it helped reduce the hyperviscosity related retinopathy. Which brings us to our man in Providence. Okay. So here he is. The same picture I showed you. Oh, sorry. The click, the pointer also advances my slides. You see all the hemorrhages. Six weeks later, he looks pretty good. You don't see many hemorrhages. So we had several plasmophoresis treatments in between here and here. If in general, you have a hemorrhage, and you can find the etiology of that hemorrhage and treat it, a small hemorrhage, not a huge one, will go away in about six weeks. So if you had a hemorrhage here, and we found that that was due to blood platelets, say, in about six to eight weeks, that hemorrhage would resolve. And if you had, uh, solved your platelet problem, shouldn't return. So here's plasmophoresis, and you can see this, I look at this big hemorrhage. So if you go to the doctor today, and he says you have a lot of hemorrhages in your eye, and it's from Waldenstrom, it doesn't mean that you're going blind. If you can get your Waldenstrom's under control, the hemorrhages can reabsorb. Um, I don't know if that's clear. Now, if you've had a massive bleed, like the one I showed you back here, um, you're kind of too late. I mean, yes, if you do get better, but you've kind of missed the ball game. So that's why people who have IgM of 10,000, there used to be a 10,000 club. Uh, in my personal opinion, though, this is just my personal opinion and who am I, I'm sitting on a keg of dynamite. It's not something that I personally would do. I, wouldn't, I couldn't sleep at night if my IgM was 10,000, knowing what I know, wanting what I do for a living every day. That doesn't mean, however, that I'm telling you what to do. We do know little hemorrhages, you get the Waldenstrom's better, your vision will improve or your hemorrhaging will improve. And this is just showing someone getting plasmoceresis. Now, so the question is, uh, should a patient be treated if their IgM is 4,000 and there's only one or two hemorrhages in the far periphery, which only a doctor who did scleral depression sees? And there's no consistent answer. Just like there's no consistent treatment, what you should be treated on versus your neighbor versus someone else. Um, there's usually no consistency that I've read on that, okay? The other thing that you should know about Waldenstrom. So I know some of you tend to get frustrated when you go to the eye doctor and they don't know much about Waldenstrom's. Um, the problem is, it's, it's rare disease, guys. 
So uh, they might not know about the central serous maculopathy. Why? Because we see a lot of diseases. Um, I would hope that they would at least pick up a book or go on internet and look at the ocular signs if they have the patient sitting in the chair because they're all certainly capable of retinoxing the hemorrhages and the uh, retinopathy because we see it in other diseases, but they might not know that it goes with wall instruments. In many ways, many of you here I know feel unlucky, but in many ways there are many people out there in the community who have Waldenstrom's who have not been diagnosed. So what do I mean by that? So there are many women who are in their late 40s, maybe early 50s, who have low crits, have had low crits for years, but lousy for years, and everyone just says, well, menses, heavy menses. And it's not heavy menses, it's Wildenstrom's. But it takes a keen doctor to diagnose that. Most people who have low crits who are men, it's GI bleeds. So they find a little GI bleed, eh, it doesn't get that whole much better. So in many ways, you're fortunate that you have been diagnosed. Once you were diagnosed and you go to an eye doctor, they know what to look for. Going backwards, have I ever diagnosed anybody with Wolfenstrom's from looking at their eye? Yes, I have, but I'm keen into it. It's very hard to look at an eye and then say, oh yes, you have Wolfenstrom's. But knowing you have Wolfenstrom's, you should know what the eye problems can be. So you can get this central serous maculopathy. So what happens is you have a macula here. So here is our macula region. And usually the macula dips like this to give us good vision dead center. But what happens is the IgM acts like a vacuum and pulls water out of the retina and it causes it to swell, not in everybody, but in some people. And you get a retina that looks like it has big bubbles in it. When you're just doing your eye exam, it doesn't look bad. You have to do an OCT to really see this. So basically when you have a cataract, which makes it even harder for you to see the back of the eye, Oh, your vision's done, it's from the cataract. Please make sure that you have an OCT done. So this poor gentleman, this isn't his cataract, but this is his OCT, had his cataract out because of his decreased vision, only to find out that the problem was from this central serous maculopathy because taking the cataract out didn't really help. So my thing is always do an OCT of the macula before you have the cataract out to make sure that's the etiology of the decreased vision. How is this treated? How is this maculopathy treated? Well, here's the scoop. It's treated by getting your Wolfenstrom's under control. You gotta lower your IgM. You gotta lower the IgM and then this can improve. Once it's wet, it's like sitting in the puddle. It can't be wet for too long. You, I mean, you can't, if you sat in a puddle of water for weeks and months, it would be hard to get the wrinkles out. Now you take go to the shower, you're a little wrinkly, then it pops back. Uh, the retina doesn't like having all this water, for lack of a better term, in it. There have been many people, and if you read the literature, whose maculas look like this, who had a few hemorrhages here and there, and they treated them with anti-VEGFs. Now, some of you who have wet macular degeneration may have heard these terms, Avastin, Lucentis, there's several of them out there. And the people didn't get that much better. And it was only when the doctors, the eye doctors kept pursuing, why is this person not getting better? that they found out they had Waldenstrom's. On the other hand, if you read the literature, 
there have been people who have treated this in addition to treating it with um, something for the Waldenstroms who have also been tried anti-VEGFs um, and they have gotten a little better. So if you have that, uh, you need to get your IgM under control, see how bad it is, and then decide, a uh, retina specialist and your oncologist will decide how quickly you need to act is just getting the IgM under control or you, do you need some anti-VEGFs, okay? This is telling you how this happens for those who are interested because I know there are several of you who want to know the pathophysiology, but I'm not going to read it. You can read it on your own. Here's some showing some more. Now this looks so bad. Um, so this is taken by an OCT, um, optic coherence topography. Think of it like ultrasound, only it uses infrared light. It uses a laser light. Now this looks horrible. It is horrible. But when you look at it on the eye, if you go back here and look, this is what this eye looks like. Doesn't look so bad. But when we look and we do like, I say to my patients, we're gonna go in and do like a little CAT scan. I call it like a little CAT scan to look at the layers of your eye. This OTC, the, how well it can do, it can get down to five microns. It's so much better than an MRI or a CAT scan as far as giving you detail. All right, here's another patient that I saw years ago. And when I say many of you are lucky that you have the diagnosis, he was an 80 year old man and he came from for a routine eye exam and he just wanted glasses. I saw a lot of hemorrhages in his far periphery. His crit was 26.5 and he was living on transfusions. Okay. I looked at his old record. Uh, I used to work many, many years for the VA. And I looked at his old records and he had MGUS when he was here with us. And then he kind of moved and he just went privately. So what had happened is MGUS had turned to Waldenstrom's and his oncologist that he was seeing never tested him for Waldenstrom's. I called up and said, I think your guy probably has Waldenstrom's. He had monoclonal myopathy of unknown significance. Did you test him for Waldenstrom's? Um, and he had not, um, he had not. So the guy had been living on 80 milligrams of steroids was hemolytic, had steroidist induced diabetes. Uh, and this is one of the few guys I made a huge change in his life. So he was really on his way out. He looked terrible. Called his oncologist. I said, you need to test him. You need to do a bone marrow. Please do that. He had Waldenstrom's. He was treated. He came back four months later. I was not in the office at the time. And my resident saw him and said, oh my God, Dr. Hamley, you're not gonna believe. He's like a perky 80 year old. He said, just couldn't believe the difference. So this is what I mean in many ways. You're lucky you at least you know the diagnosis. Okay. All right, let's talk about normal aging versus Waldenstrom's and how they're related. Let's get back to our eye. So we have our conjunctiva and you, you all heard of pink eye. That's when the conjunctiva gets kind of red and inflamed. It covers the white part of your eye. So the conjunctiva would be right in here, right in here. It's right where I'm pointing to right there. Okay. It can be affected with Waldenstrom's because it has blood in it. Okay. And under the slit lamp, it's really quite amazing when you have a low hematocrit, you can actually see rather than it being a steady stream of blood. So the blood, usually when you look at it, you can see it. You can actually see blood, no blood, blood, no blood, blood, no blood when you have a low hematocrit. So we look at that with a slit lamp. Also, we pull your lid down and you may or may not be aware of um, in many, third world countries, unfortunately, if they don't have enough money or resources to test everyone for 
anemia, especially anemia caused from lead poisoning. They pull the kids' lids down and see if they're pink. So this is normal. This is a very pale conjunctiva. So this person's crit was 22 at the time. This is when that same person got a little bit better and it was about 30 at the time. This is another patient of mine. This yellow, forget it, that's just a dye we put in. And you can see it doesn't matter what skin color they are, the inside is very pale. Um, this guy um, didn't have Walden's Jones, but had a thalassemia, I believe. And here you can see how the blood gets sludged on the conjunctiva. Next, subconjunctival hemorrhages. These are common whether you have diabetes or not. You cough, you're constipated, you push. The little blood breast vessel breaks and it's like putting some blood in, into a toilet, one drop and the whole thing kind of turns kind of red. The space is very, um, what's the word I'm looking for? It's very loose, it's very loose. So the blood just kind of splatters in there. It's usually not a problem, but it is a big problem if you are on blood thinners such as Coumadin or platelet counts are low, because it may be signaling a bad thing. So if your INR is way off, you need to get that adjusted immediately. So anyone who's on Coumadin, we send immediately for an INR. If they're on the newer blood thinners, I mean, and you guys all know that when I say blood thinners, it's not truly a blood thinner. If it was a blood thinner, they would help you guys with serum viscosity. They're antiplatelet drugs. So the blood kind of thins out, but it doesn't help hyperviscosity syndrome. Uh, so you could take all the cumin in the world, it's not going to help your hyperviscosity. Um, so here's some, let's get back to some conjunctival hemorrhage. So here, this is fine. You should call your doctor if it's related to trauma or if you're on blood thinners, you need to be seen. Here's some more, they usually resolve within two weeks. Um, if however, you ever have plasmapheresis and develop a big subconjunctival hemorrhage immediately after, you need to get seen stat. Um, one guy on the list did lose total vision in his eye because not only did the conge bleed, but the back of the eye bled and he lost vision because in a sense, the optic nerve was choked from all the blood. So take a message. Usually, you know, you should call your eye doctor just to run it by them, but usually not a problem, except if they're recurrent. So if you have one this month, then you have one next month, something is systemically wrong, whether it's hypertension, diabetes, your platelet count, your hematocrit, whatever. And certainly if you have them in your borderline, you might want to call your doctor just to make sure your CBC is okay. Dry eye, it's the most common complaint we get. My eyes are dry and it's worse with people working at home and it's worse because everyone is masked up and it's worse because the population's getting older and it's a problem whether you have Weldon's drums or not. People work at these computers all day long. They look at their phones, they don't blink. Approximately 20% of all Americans suffer from dry eye. They're more prevalent in postmenopausal women and Wallerstrom may make this problem worse because they may have an autoimmune effect on the lacrimal gland. So basically, we used to think that all dry eye had to do with the lacrimal gland. So the lacrimal gland is right here. It's like under your frontal bone. And it really makes the tears that you cry with. So if you hear bad news, your cat dies, you cry, those tears there. But those tears aren't so great. They're not good for dry eyes. The other ones come from your other glands like in your lower lid and upper lid. And every time we blink, we get new aqueous. 
And all the new theories are saying that the problem is with your meibomian glands, which are right near your eyelashes. And if you pull your eyelashes down and you have magnification, you can see all the little orifices. However, Wolfenstrom people do have autoimmune problems with their lacrimal gland. So it's probably a combination of both the meibomian gland and the lacrimal gland. We know Velcade is really bad on the meibomian glands. Um, we know ibrutinib also causes dry eye. So when you have dry eye, what's really happening is the cornea is not wetting properly and it actually causes little pits. So if this is your cornea surface, excuse me. So if this is your cornea surface, your first layer of your cornea is your epithelium. And it actually causes like little pits in your epithelium. Then when I put the stain in the stain, goes in the, the little pit and all of this is dryness. Okay. It's what we call, if you ever heard the term SPK. Okay. What can be done for dry eye? Well, this, you got to first find out what it is. Is it evaporative? Is it aqueous deficient? Is it mixed? Is it caused from some of your meds? Some of your meds you can play with, some you can't play with. It varies depending on the type of dry eye you have, artificial tears. It's more expensive, but do try to get the non-preserved ones. The preserved ones can also cause allergic reactions on your eye, which isn't good. Warm compresses can help to get the glands massaged in your lower lids and upper lids. There are machines that you can put your eyelids through with that help unblock or unclog. You might bone in glands, you can wear moisture chambers. The restasis is good if you have lacrimal um, gland problems as well as Zyatra. So these are good for lacrimal problems. Sometimes low dose steroid drops help. Punk the plugs can help. Scleral contact lenses. You can actually make tears which do help from your blood. Only the big centers do that. Uh, I don't know if I'd want my blood if you had Waldenstrom's going in my eye, but we do it with other people. And we also have amniotic membranes that we can put in cases of severe dry eye. This is what I talked about my meibomian problem. So all your meibomian glands are all here on the bottom. And when they get plugged or they don't have the right kind of oils, they look like little soap sods. Makeup is very bad. Um, I say to my patients, I don't care what you live, wear above the eyelid. That's a dermatologist. But you can't get the makeup in here and blocking these glands because you're going to run into dry eye problems. Here's your puncture that drains the fluid. If you're not making enough tears, you can put a plug in it and close it up. The problem is plugs are good if you're not making enough tears. But if your eyes have all these soap suds in them, this will act like a sewage cap if you plug it. And then all the waste would be more here and make things worse. So it depends on the etiology of your dry eye. Plugs can help and plugs can make it worse. And here's just showing a plug. Oh, we know Valcade, uh, well-known, causes Chalazians, which are actually, when I did the little poker, it's actually those glands getting blocked and you can see the Chalazian here. So we have Hordeolums. And then you have Chalazians. Um, Hordeolums is when they're red and hot. You got warm compresses to death. Chalazium is when they go into a granuloma and then you can't hot compress them to death and then you're left with the lump. So anytime you get a lump on your eyelid, try to hot compress it if it's due to a sty. A hodioma is another word for sty because if not, it can create a chalazium. 
cornea, I'll be honest with you, it's in every literature, it's in all books ever since I was a student. I have never seen the corneal changes with lymphoplasmacytic lymphoma. A recent article, um, they looked at 91 people, they saw it in two, and I have never seen it. Um, I, I, would, it, I would love to know how many people on this talk who have Walden's trump have any cornea problems. Some of you have fuchs, some of you have other corneal problems, but the um, deposits you can get from Walden's trumps, I have not seen it. And I have not seen it in multiple of my lower patients either. They look like these little crystals, or they look like plaques like this. This is not fuchs. Fuchs is different, fuchs is hereditary. Can you get changes in your eyeglasses from Waldenstrom's? Well, here's the scoop. If you're on steroids and your blood sugar goes up, it doesn't go up in everyone. As your blood sugar goes up, your blood sugar level goes up. Um, in general, your refractive error changes. In general, you become more myopic. Okay. Um, and some people, they become more hyperopic. Yep, got it, Jessica. Okay, the lens. As you get 40 to 50, you have trouble focusing it near. As you get older, um, you get cataracts. Do you get Waldenstrom's cataracts earlier? Uh, probably not from the disease. Whenever you have steroids, it increases your risk of getting cataracts. Steroids increase your risk of getting cataracts, especially a type of cataract called a posterior subcapsular cataract. And I give you some statistics, how many people get cataracts just normally. There are many different kinds of cataracts. Um, this is the type you get from steroids, which is called a PSC cataract. So you can just read all of this. Some people are on a ton of steroids. They never get them. They must have a gene that protects them. And others, um, uh, one study found that 75% of patients receiving 50 milligrams a day of pregnisone got the cataract within a year. So it's all over the place, but we do know in general, the more steroids you take increases your risk, okay? Now, it increases your risk substantially if you have to take them by an injection in your eye. Um, then if you take topical, it increases it, then oral, and then inhale like if you have a puff. So this is the worst for cataracts followed by this. Now, naturally it depends. You know, if you're on hundred milligrams of steroids, prednisone for a year, it's gonna be worse than if you're on, you know, Prev Forte three times a day for a few weeks. And I tell you how steroids, what is the mechanism behind steroids getting cataracts? And I just show you some cataracts. So I'm getting the little knob, my timer is running low. Let me just quickly explain glaucoma. So glaucoma, um, Jessica, could, could you hold up what time it is? Because I shut off my uh, phone. So glaucoma, Waldenstrom's people are also more prone to glaucoma. Glaucoma is when the pressure inside your eye is usually high, so it kills your optic nerve. Waldenstrom's people are prone to glaucoma despite the fact that they may indeed have low pressure. So you should always make sure you get your eye exam that includes not only looking at your retina, but looking at your optic nerve. And what happens in the optic nerve is this nice pink tissue dies. And you can see the little rim is very small here. And then it kills the optic nerve. Here is a patient who has Waldenstrom, who has low tension glaucoma. And you can see he has little no rim tissue here and you can see the hemorrhage that he has here. And this is the um, his side vision test. 
So I have a lot more to do here. Um, people ask me to touch on Bing Neal. Bing Neal again is very rare. It causes more neuroophthalmology problems than retina. It can cause a nerve double vision, double vision when both your eyes are open, not one eye. Cataract can cause kind of a, what we call monocular double vision because you get haze. You can get optic atrophy. Um, you can get what we call INOs when, when you go to look to one side, the eye jiggle jiggles. When you go to look at the other side, the eye jiggle jiggles with nystagmus. It is rare. Um, here's some optic atrophy of a patient with Waldenstrom's. Here is an OTCT. Everything in the red is bad. And these are showing your visual fields. So we're going to end with you're more prone to glaucoma. You can get cataracts early if you've been on steroids or had any injections in your eye. Keep an eye, have a dilated exam, have them look at the periphery, check for any hemorrhages, any problems with your vision, call your eye doctor immediately. Uh, it's not good to get on the website and say, oh, my vision is really down in one eye. What do you think? Yeah, I care you can't do telemedicine with. You have to go in, you have to be looked at. So those are some of my recommendations. Make sure you have an OCT before you have cataract surgery. So I'm gonna just cover, and these are all my references here. They sent me some of the questions. So Paul is gonna ask me the questions. Okay. Dr. Hanley, thank you for your presentation, your wonderful presentation on WM and the eye and ocular disease because I'm sure we all have a lot of questions in regards to this. Our first question is, your recommendations include an OCT before cataract surgery and an OCT of the macula if, I, if IgM is above 3000, especially if there's unexpected visual acuity loss. What is an OCT? And does every doctor have, they have the ability to have an, do the OCT? So I would say, Say not everyone has it, but I would say the instrument costs about $85,000. Um, certainly we have it. Um, I would say most people have it. I would say anyone who's doing cataract surgery have it. So basically you wanna make sure before you have the cataract, oh, that the vision is from losses from the cataract and not the macula. And I showed the big humps in the macula. So you just want to make sure that indeed it's from the cataract, which it probably is. And not only people above 3,000, anyone with Waldenstrom should have an OCT of the macula before they have cataract surgery. It only takes about a minute. The whole scan takes about a minute. It takes you about four or five minutes to get your head in the right way in the machine and then to get your name in the whole nine yards. But the, the actual test only takes about a minute an eye. Okay, our next question. Is retinal examination part of a regular exam? So a dilated eye exam is certainly part of my regular eye exam, except if you come in for a, a problem specific. So Paul, if you came in with a subconjunctival hemorrhage, I would just look at the front of your eye unless you're on platelet problem, unless you're on a platelet re, um, Unless you had a platelet problem or you were on a blood thinner, then I would dilate you. But usually we just come in and look at the front of the eye. If you had a scratch in the eye, you would just look. But any full eye exam should include a dilated retinal exam. Not everyone does the depression. I, I, I'm a firm believer in doing the scleral depression. Next. So the next question is, what are the symptoms of dry eye? Can imbrutinib cause dry eye? And so I there was a small study that I looked up for you. Um, they only had four out of five patients. It was like um, just looking at all chemotherapy drugs and four of the five people either had a red or a dry eye on ibrutinib. Uh, their recommendation was you should take rewetting drops if you're going to go on it. Um, there's no explanation of why this is really happening. 
Uh, I don't think it's that serious. Just um, naturally, there might be someone in the audience who had a serious problem with dry eye. But basically, yes, Ibrutin and Velcade, we know are related to dry eyes. Velcade, we know it's the meibomian gland. Ibrutin, we don't know what's causing it. Eye drops certainly help, but eye drops do not cure dry eyes. They're just like a crutch. Sometimes you can get at the cure to it, sometimes you cannot. But yes, we do know. And they just feel like grit, like your eyes feel like gritty. And sometimes your vision is blurry. And then I say to them, blink, does it clear up? That's usually a sign of dry eye. If when you blink, your vision clears up. And that's certainly a sign that you need to get it treated. The problem is some of us has a neuropathy and just like diabetics, we don't feel the dry eye as much because we have decreased sensitivity in our cornea. So when we go for an eye exam, we should also see if our eyes are dry. Most, the vast majority of people, their eyes are dry and they come in and it's like, we hear it all day long and it's like, oh, another dry eye. Cause there's not, there's stuff we can do, but we can't cure it. But if you have neuropathy, you should make sure the doctor looks for dry eye because you may indeed have, be causing damage, but you don't feel it. When people usually have dry eye, they feel like they have grit, like sand, like you walk out in Boston on a windy day, they feel that kind of grit sandy in their eyes. And those are the symptoms. What are boxcar veins in the eye? Uh, the term is venous boxcarring, that's the term. And that happens after an artery occlusion. So after an artery occlusion, this is an artery occlusion, all where this is white is death to the eye. The eye is dead. It's like a stroke to the eye. So when you, you know, we have arteries and we go arteries, arterioles, uh, capillary beds, venioles, and then veins. And what happens when you kill one system, eventually the other system is affected. And you can see right in here where there's blood and then there's no blood. There's blood and then there's no blood. That's called venous box carring. It's like a train in the box cars. There's gaps in between each car. And that's why it's called venous box carring. Does WM affect the macula? So we talked all about OCT and macular and high IgM, it can. But just remember, it's not the same as macular degeneration. Many of you suffer from macular degeneration. It's different than macular degeneration. Uh, macular degeneration has to do with drusen and not uh, uh, the waste products in the macular. It's a different type of macular than macular degeneration. And that's another two hour talk, macular degeneration. Sorry. Can macular puckers be caused by or related to WM? If so, will treatment for WM slow the development of macular puckers? Okay, so most macular puckers are due to epiretinal membranes. So here we see a membrane here. What happens is there's a break in what we call the internal limiting membrane, the very difference between the fluid hitting your eye and the top of your retina. And it causes proliferation of glial cells. And it actually puckers up the macula. And you can see this very good in this picture. Most of the time, these puckers cause problems for the macula area to raise up. Occasionally, in a rare occasion, the macula being raised from uh, central serous maculopathy with diabetes can cause the pucker, but that would be like very, very rare to happen. Um, can it be caused by Waldenstrom's? It could theoretically be caused by Waldenstrom's, but most of the time it's caused either from trauma or when our vitreous between the ages of 50 and 75, the vitreous attack detaches, detaches from the retina. That's when we get a lot of floaters. That can be very serious. Usually there's a little break in the li internal limiting membrane and we get these epiretinal membranes. The problem with this, this can surgically be repaired, but the surgery is very, very difficult. And the results, usually they don't even operate unless the person's 2050. So, 
Can it be caused from mold and stuff in a rare possibility, but most of the time it's not? Is having cataracts in an early age, 40s, associated with WM? I mean, it's associated with not necessarily WM, but with steroid use. In many people who have WM have been on steroids. Not all, but many. Can WM cause blindness? Um, loaded question, like can walking across the street kill you? Can getting on an airplane kill you? <laughs> you know, you shouldn't go to sleep when you're going to go blind from Morgenstrom's. You should go to sleep saying, I need to monitor my IgM so I don't get a big vein occlusion like that lady showed me. Um, so I, I don't want anyone worrying about after seeing this talk going blind from Waldenstrom's. Does it ever happen? Has it ever happened? Certainly it has happened. Because both veins can almost occlude on the same time. But I wouldn't worry about it unless you're playing Russian roulette. And what are you playing Russian roulette for? I don't know. What are you walking around with 11,000 IgM and doing nothing? It's your priority. You know, everyone is different. I woke up one morning and the white part of one of my eyes looked like it was bleeding. Should I be concerned? Again, most times it's fine. You should check in with your eye doctor. If your blood counts are poor or if you're any, on any blood thinner, um, you should get it looked at, okay? Uh, we were looking to buy a new car. We did not buy a new car. And all of a sudden my eye starts bleeding and my husband freaked out. And I said, oh, don't worry about it, it's nothing. As he got on the phone and called one of my best girlfriends because he thought I was hiding something from him. So it's very frightening to, to look at. And you can see this is a picture of me. You don't recognize me because my white hair is covered. Um, and I just, we were looking at the car and all of a sudden I got a subconscious type of hemorrhage. It's no pain, you don't feel it. But the husband kind of freaked out. How do you know uh, which issues are important or related to WM and not just to advanced aging or some other issue? What should we look for particularly? So retinal hemorrhaging is not part of normal aging. You should be able to go through your whole life and not have any retinal hemorrhaging. If you live long enough, and I hate to say this as I get older, if we live long enough, we will all get cataracts. So if we all live to be 90, we're all going to get a cataract. But if we all live to be 90, we should not have any retinal hemorrhages. Our retina stays intact and it should not bleed. So if you have retinal hemorrhages, that is abnormal. Is it from Waldenstrom's? It may be. It may also be because you're diabetic or some other problem. The last thing I just did was a new thing that came out and I got to move my thing here at the spectrum of ocular manifestations in patients with Waldenstrom's. And they looked at 91 patients in Italy. Now, again, each profile is different. Italians have different diets. Italians have different makeups. We have uh, you know, more people who are African-American and we have more Asian-Americans than I believe they do in Italy. I don't know, I've never been to Italy, but this was the study and um, ocular impairment was found in 19 out of the 91 patients. This here, this, you may not be familiar, that's an EOM palsy from neuropathy of the eye muscles. And that's it. So I'm sorry I rushed the, the end part a little bit. It's always hard to say. And I do miss um, you not being able to yell out a question for me, or, um, but I hope you have enjoyed it. And I'm gonna get the hook, right? Cause I only have a half a minute left. So I don't know how many were on, if someone could tell me how many was on. Some of you may have heard parts of this talk before. 200 I participants. I wanna thank you for the people who have Waldenstrom's who allowed me to show their eye photos on this talk. You can't identify them because the retina, you can't, they don't have any names to them. When you lecture on eyelids, it's a big problem because you can see all the people's faces. So I wish you all the best of luck. And I am on the uh, talk list. If you ever have any issues, just give me a few days to um, 
respond back because it's a very busy time with COVID and patients and students. Okay. All righty. Okay. Dr. Hanley, thank you. Okay. IMF is exceptionally grateful for you and for coming to the presentation, sharing your time and in-depth knowledge and information in regards to Waldenstrom and the eye. I think this is fair to say for a lot of us, this is a new thing and it's something that we need to also be looking at where we may not have been considering our eyes before in regards to Waldenstrom. I would like to thank our sponsors on behalf of the I, uh, WMF. I'd like to thank the Ed Farm title sponsors, Beijing Pharmacy Psycholics, Janssen, as well as Biosciences, the Treadway Foundation and X4 Pharmaceuticals. And of course, we appreciate all of you who joined us virtually today for this virtual workshop and presentation. I really hope you got something out of it that you can share and keep in your pocket in the back of your mind as we educate ourselves on all of our body and the functions and self-care we need to take in Waldenstrom. I want to advise everybody to please take a moment to complete your post survey that is going to pop up on appear on your screen once you close out and to please come back to our join our next session, which will begin promptly after the break at 2 p.m. You will then need to return to the program page and put, and then just touch the uh, join button to come back with us. Click the join button to come back with us. Be blessed and stay safe. Thank you all very much. Take care. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye.